вот сейчас мы найдем себя. Или нет уже? Есть. Есть это у кого у вас? Ну, есть, есть. Вот, вот, пожалуйста. Вот, пожалуйста. О? А как вы считаете? А сейчас тебе надо цепи... тут армия. А. If you had run for office again, I and all my friends would have voted for you. Do you still feel that you're a man of the people? Yes, yes, yes indeed, without a doubt. Even now this is something within me and I cannot deny it. It would be like denying the most important element within me. Will the wedding be big? Yes, the biggest. How old are you? He's 21, I'm 17. Huh? 17. Ay, ay, ay! When we were first married and attending Moscow University, Raisa and I had to live separately. In fact, Raisa lived in Zone E and I lived in Zone V. Men and women were kept separate. And when I was in her block of rooms, the hall monitor would lock on the door at 11 o'clock and say, you have an outsider in your room. They already knew that we were husband and wife. We had been registered and we had shown our passports, everything. But even a husband was an outsider, so I left. But as the law school's young communist leader, I soon called a meeting and forced the dean to change that rule. So you see, even then I could change things. I first had the pleasure of meeting you in 1987. When I first shook your hand, I said I know you, because by that time I knew and had read your work, particularly your Bukharin book that was available here then only unofficially. Yes, a lot of time has passed. In the summer of 1994, Stephen Cohen, professor of politics and Russian studies at Princeton University and a CBS News consultant, met in Moscow with the former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev, whom he has known well for many years. Their spirited talks about the past, present and future stretched over three days and were taped at the Gorbachev Foundation and at Lenin Hills near Moscow University. The following program is made possible by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding is provided by Public Radio International. I want to thank you for this, uh, what, I, what I hope is going to be an unusual conversation. Unusual because you are, I think, the only Soviet leader and probably the only leader in Russian history who, who connected with the American people in a human way. And even today, many Americans remember where they were in August 1991, when they learned that a tank coup in Moscow had struck against Gorbachev, and Americans still remember watching on television your safe return to Moscow a few days later, when you, your wife, Raisa Maximovna, and the rest of your family came down the airplane steps. Of course, Steve, I am at your disposal. For me, you are a good conversational partner, and also a difficult one, because you know us better than others do, and to some extent you probably know me better than I know myself, because things are more apparent when viewed from the outside. You uh, created many precedents in your political biography. But, but yet another precedent when you left office. So far as I can think, you are the first Soviet leader and maybe the first Russian leader 
to have had a public political life after power. Every other Soviet leader died in office, except Khrushchev, who was overthrown and then forbidden any public role. On the other hand, Americans expect their former presidents to have a public life after leaving office. Yes, there were no Russian precedents. On that account, you are right. But in this more open world, we knew that such precedents exist, in the United States, for example. Of course, I was concerned, and continue to be concerned, with the fate of what I began, both the reforms I began in my country, which we called perestroika, and the great changes in the world brought about by our new thinking, and the new international relations that have not yet really brought about a new world order. I have seen how difficult it is, not only in this country and in Eastern Europe, but also in the West. In the West, for many years, and even now, the point of view was spread that the East is changing, but in the West there is nothing to change. It is on the right track, going in the right direction. Our policies have given the world new opportunities that must be used. But the whole world is at a crossroads now, and as we approach the next century, we must rethink where we are. In particular, I have something to defend so that all that I have done doesn't fall apart and come to an end. Therefore, I came to the conclusion that I should create the Gorbachev Foundation, which allows me to deal with the same problems of reform in Russia and in the countries of the former Soviet Union. I also can still address international issues, which I remain interested in. And I also decided that I ought to write my memoirs, which I did during the last two and a half years. I call the book My Life and Reforms. It is now at the publishers being translated. It will be published here in Russia and abroad. I think it will be useful. And not only for politicians, but also everyone who lived through this period with us, and who want to understand it better and learn about my reasoning and thoughts. It is also useful for the next generation. It is important for them to understand what happened, what were the reforms we call perestroika, what made this period special in our common history. I, too, have been reading books about Gorbachev and uh, articles, uh, many of them, writ written in the West and written here. I'm amazed by the utterly conflicting things that so many people say about Gorbachev. How is it possible that so many opposite things are said about one political leader? Here's what people have written about Gorbachev. The greatest reformer in Russian history, the leader who destroyed his own country. A great idealist, a man who betrayed his own party ideals. A great humanist, a prince of darkness. The father of Russian democracy, the leader who blocked real democratization in Russia a brave and courageous leader, a timid and indecisive leader, communism's greatest heretic, communism's last defender, a masterful politician, a great bungler, the liberator of Eastern Europe, the man who gave away Russia's security. I have heard practically all of these themes. Several of these themes had already begun to be sounded when I was still president and general secretary. Much of what happened was written up as thoughts and impressions about the reform policies of perestroika. Others were related to anti-reform efforts and activities of those reactionary forces who also weren't sitting on their hands, and at a certain stage waged an open battle against reform and even sabotage against reform. There are different viewpoints about how and why you came to power in 1985. Some people say that reform was inevitable and that Gorbachev himself didn't matter. Others say it was an accident of politics and personality. Were you an accident? It wasn't an accident that Gorbachev ended up as this reformer and could respond decisively to calls and pushes that came from society. I remember those years of repression in the 1930s. I remember that I was with my own grandfather in our village in Stavropol when he was arrested as an enemy of the people. He was a poor peasant who had accepted Soviet rule and took part in the building of Soviet power and then was accused of being an enemy of the people. My family lived through this. He went through the torture chambers of the KGB. And my wife Raisa's grandfather was shot during that time. I was eight years old at that time, and I remember what happened to my grandfather very well. It will remain with me forever. 
My other grandfather was a peasant who didn't accept collectivization and didn't join a collective farm. He was my grandfather on my father's side, and he remained an individual peasant farmer. This was something I could never forget. I have seen the face of war. I was in occupied territory. The front passed us twice when the Germans came all the way to the northern Caucasus and to Stalingrad, which was not far away. I have seen the tragedies and destruction that war brings. I have seen what was done with the peasants under Stalin. For them, the collective farm turned out to be a second version of serfdom. A peasant couldn't leave not only the collective farm, but not even the settlement where he lived. A peasant was supposed to work a certain number of days in the collective, or else he lost everything. He didn't have a passport. He was enslaved. I know all this. I know how the peasants were smothered with taxes. A peasant farmstead was supposed to pay taxes on the milk and meat, whether or not cattle was raised on that farm. You had to give 20 kilograms of meat and 120 liters of milk to the state, and you had to pay a tax for every tree in your garden, whether it bore fruit or not. That didn't matter. I saw all of this. Finally, from when I was 15 years old, I worked on a farm combine. I worked for six years. And when I finished school and left to study at Moscow University, I was already a person who had quite a bit of life experience on my shoulders. The 1930s, the war, the destruction left by the war, and early physical labor. Nobody ever had to force me to study. I wanted to myself. I was very curious by nature, and probably already had some leadership qualities. And then I went to Moscow University. Moscow University was always a breeding ground of a certain activism. Still Stalin's time? Yes, even in Stalin's time, the atmosphere there was different from other schools. Without the university and without the experience I had beforehand, Gorbachev would not have been prepared to engage in his political career and realize his potential. From our conversation, I know that up there, Moscow University, is the birthplace of the great reform. But probably it's also a sentimental place, because you met your wife, Raisa Maximovna, up there, if I understand correctly. Yes. Therefore, probably it has some significance for you beyond politics. Well, I think that you could say, in general, that without the university, Gorbachev would not have turned out the way that he did. He would have been a completely different person. The university was that important? Well, there were characteristics in my nature, my schooling and life he lived that all contributed a lot. But in general, without the university, my nature would have been very rough and unpolished. I, I don't know what would have come of it. Maybe I would have sunk like a stone. You know, that's also an American theme. A young man from the provinces, from the heartland, comes to the big city. Do you know that when I came from my hometown, I first had to ride 35 kilometers on horses to just get to the railroad station. Then I rode on a train for the first time in my life. To come here, it was the first time? It was the first time that I'd been on a train. Remarkable. That was an unbelievable leap, of course. Imagine, there in a southern village where there was no radio, no electricity, no asphalt. We didn't even know what asphalt was. Nothing and where there was a very sharp delineation between day and night. The southern night is dark with such a high sky with a tent of stars. And then suddenly I was here and didn't know when it was day and when it was night, especially during the summertime when you can read outside at 10 at night. And then all of a sudden the night is over. And then a city full of electricity. It was something new to me. My life right after the university was a life connected to the provinces, back in Stavropol, close to the life of the people. And for me, people's lives are not something I know from books. I know it from my nature. I am from the people myself, and I know about people's lives. So all of this prepared me as I look back on it now. Of course, I didn't think I was preparing myself to be general secretary of the Communist Party and president of the Soviet Union. <laughs> that would have been funny. I simply lived my life. I simply lived my life. 
so the people, the many people, your, your, your many critics here and in the West who say that Gorbachev, after he came to power as general secretary in 1985, he was too slow, too timid, too indecisive. You say they're wrong. You did all that was possible under the circumstances as fast as was possible. Is that, do I understand you correctly? Whether I acted slowly or quickly, decisively or timidly, these are matters worth discussing. A new person has come to power. Someone who rejects the regime and everything that is connected with it. He brings in the idea that people need the air of freedom, democracy, and openness, a normal human attitude toward life, human values. That was enough for people to trust, but not enough had been studied and publicly discussed by us. Everything had been discussed privately in the kitchen. So many conferences happened every day in kitchens all over the Soviet Union, and so many anecdotes at that time made the rounds about our life. That actually was a healthy sign that society had not lost its convictions and hope. I think that we, the new leadership, interpreted this as popular support. It truly was support, but avoided the slow and painstaking work of clarifying our ideas. Secondly, I see now that we didn't think through the question of how to involve the communist officials who accepted the reforms. Those who rejected them, well, they could make their own choices. But those who accepted reforms, but didn't know what to do, how to move towards the new reforms, towards a new form of life. We didn't use this time to prepare these people. And in this sense, we really weren't prepared. We hadn't worked out connections. We hadn't clarified. We hadn't even agreed. And so we changed while we were on the move. And this led to some problems. We hurried. Many people in the United States especially influential people, especially people associated with President Reagan, believe that they forced you to begin your reforms, uh, that they threatened to build Star Wars, uh, that they spent uh, so much money on an American military buildup that you had no choice. You had to reform the Soviet Union so that it could remain a great power. Yes, it is a great mistake. Already around 1980, the country was in a condition of heavy economic and technological stagnation. There were even negative indicators, a decline in the growth of the GNP. Not to mention that society itself had grown tired of the lack of freedom. Therefore, the main and deciding impetus came from within our society itself. And earlier attempts to reform are also an indication that all this arose from society. And naturally, having taken on reform, we had to think about changes in the international situation. And the foreign situation led directly to questions of the arms race, to questions of the nuclear weapons race. This did stimulate us. And by the beginning of 1986, we announced our plan to move towards a nuclear-free world and a gradual reduction of all weapons. I understand. But why, if, 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 if the impetus for reform came from within the Soviet Union, from economic problems, social problems, political problems, and this was understood. Why was there so much opposition to your reforms after you came to power? We began to experience this opposition to the reforms 
through the maldistribution of the reforms themselves. Even before political reforms took place, these reforms began to affect the interests of many party bureaucrats and brought the question of economic independence for private industries to the forefront. These reforms required significantly different laws. People could no longer be made to live from decrees from above. But this undermined most importantly the monopoly of power in both the upper echelons of bureaucratic officials in Moscow and in the regions. Their power, which was based on the state economic enterprises, was shifting to the enterprises themselves, to the workers' collectives, as we called them then. This was understood by party and state officials, and they began to resist. At first, this was expressed as caution and inaction and an attempt to wait it out and see what would happen. They feared losing power. Yes, yes. And finally, when we proposed arms reductions, the curtailment of the arms race and had received an adequate response from the American side in agreement, this immediately disturbed the whole military-industrial complex. It meant that the situation was changing for them. A new life was beginning. The military-industrial complex was a state within the state, which was accustomed to privileged orders, privileged access to raw materials, privileged access to housing, products, higher salaries. The social sphere was better equipped in the closed military cities which worked in the defense complex. It frightened them. It threatened the interests of the generals. Did you personally feel this opposition? I certainly did. I certainly did. But I should say that up to a point, I was able to forge a consensus without much effort. The program for a nuclear-free world by the year 2000 was worked out with help from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Defense, and the KGB and the defense sector. It wasn't just thought up on a whim by Gorbachev and Foreign Minister Shevardnadze. At, at that time, in the, uh, in the late 1980s, as your reforms in foreign policy and domestic policy deepened, you didn't feel a threat to your position? You didn't think they threw off, they overthrew Khrushchev, they made Trey do that to me? The feeling did arise that the same thing could happen to me that happened to Khrushchev. I'd simply be removed. I had to find an answer. How could I protect myself and prevent the situation that came about with Khrushchev? I saw that in one way or another I had to include the people, the citizens who supported the reformers at the top. Democracy. Yes. But I would say that the democratic process had been going on from the very beginning. The reforms I had in mind were meant to bring about a distribution of power, with the result that the Communist Party should move away from its commanding functions and focus on political and ideological issues, activities, and aspects. And secondly, we wanted free elections with competition for deputy seats in a real parliament and with local Soviets, to hold elections in such a way that people were really able to choose. If you became a Democrat or a democratizer, because it was the only way to carry out your reforms, that means, as philosophers would say, that for you, democracy was an instrument and not an end in itself. By that time, I had adopted a different philosophical and political assumption, that a functioning democracy and the functioning institutions of democracy are the kind of environment that allows human beings to realize their potential.
From the beginning, my goal was, through the use of the democratic process and through the new democratic institutions, to allow human beings to grow and develop. In other words, we were counting on the people to recognize what was in their own best interest. Therefore, democracy was not the end in itself, but a means for creating an environment in which a human being could realize his potential as an individual. And this meant simultaneously defending his freedom and rights. And today, is that still your view about democracy? I never excluded the social aspects of democracy. That is what sets me apart from the Democrats of the West, who stop at the mechanism of democracy, at formal affirmations and strict adherence to the rules of democracy. All of that is very important. In the past, we had looked at democracy as bourgeois. Now we understand it's important. There are universal values, and democracy is among them. But I am still committed to socialist ideas. It does not prevent me from seeing and understanding the importance of liberal theories and Christian democratic principles. When I listen to you, I think somehow that you are an extraordinarily rational man in an irrational world. Um, for example, when you were leader of the Soviet Union, you wanted to introduce democracy, a market economy, glossness, or freedom of the press. Uh, all sorts of new things for Russia. But were the people, the Russian people, the Soviet people, really ready for these type of fundamental changes? You know, there is a very widespread cliché that is spread not only by journalists, but also politicians and political scientists who cater to politicians. They say, let us close our eyes to what is happening in Russia today. Let us close our eyes to the fact that the actions of those in power sometimes appear to be wild, that they can shoot their own parliament with tanks in order to settle scores with two or three opponents. Those people say, what do you expect from Russia? Russia is not ready for democracy. They are simply disrespectful of the Russian people. They simply have no experience with democracy, and it takes time to accumulate experience. But that leads to a different question. How do you move toward such a society? Who should do what to make that society? It won't happen by itself. It won't happen tomorrow. And in such reasoning, there is an understanding that such a culture, such a history, such a mentality, such experience that we have or lack, have brought me to the conclusion that here in the Soviet Union, in Russia, revolutionary methods were and are unacceptable. We need consistent reforms. We need to move in an evolutionary manner, step by step, passing through the stages of building democracy and markets. It's a Western delusion to think Russia can change overnight. What then went wrong? 